Welcome to QD Clinic, brought to you by Room Now Live, the best meeting for NPs and PAs. I'm Jack Cush from Room Now. Today's case is the NP says this patient needs help and flares off of therapy. So the story here is a 53-year-old seropositive rheumatoid arthritis patient has had RA for, since 1986, a long time, has been treated with a lot of different therapies, uh, comes in and she's doing really poorly. Actually, she had done the same thing about three or four months ago, came in both times, then and now. She's been off of her abatacept for more than four weeks and is now flaring badly. This particular patient has a history of hypothyroidism, uh, a little bit of fibromyalgia and some poor sleep. Uh, she's currently taking five milligrams of prednisone, 2,000 milligrams of sulfazalazine, and she's on abatacept. Previously, the patient has been treated with and failed a number of different medicines, including uh, Kineret, Symphony, Plaquenil, Sulfazalazine, Methotrexate, Prednisone, Humira. I'm probably leaving one or two out. So this time she comes in, and the question is, is she flaring because she's off of the abatacept or because she has another problem, like fibromyalgia and poor sleep? Often that can be easy, sometimes it's not. This particular patient says that she's been off of therapy this time for about two months, missed a total of about uh, eight shots, uh, and just started a week ago. Uh, she says that she's doing really badly. She thinks that it's her RA is really acting up. When you question her, she tells you about nerve pain, hurting all over, her shoulders, her arms, her legs, her knees, her elbows, her fingers, etc. She thinks it's RA. I'm thinking it may be fibromyalgia and her poor sleep, which she says it's poor on the survey form. However, when you examine the patient, you see she has 14 tender, 10 swollen, a number of tender points. Her CDI score, which is, is really high, it's 30. Last visit, it was 24. She was failing then. But when you look back at her, she's actually never had a really good CDI score in the last year, uh, suggesting that even when she was on the abatacept, she wasn't getting a complete response. The lowest she got to was a CDI of 15. Uh, and so the question here is, what are you going to do? You're just going to restart the, uh, the abatacept, the biologic, and hope she gets control of the disease, or whether you should, whether you should move on. So. The nurse practitioner and I were discussing this. She knows the patient maybe a little better than I do. She th believes the patient's really quite compliant, but that the problem has been the abatacept has been interrupted multiple times by changing insurance and by pharmacy problems. And, uh, and through no fault of her own, she was without medicine. So she believes that if I put her back on abatacept, which we did four months ago, three months ago, we might be in the same situation next time she comes. So the question is, do you move on or not? And I think that that's really the question that we were talking about. And for me, it was easy. Let's move on. The question is, what do you move on to? I think you have to first answer, ask the question, was the patient controlled or not on the therapy that was being interrupted? Uh, she was never controlled, it's easy to move on. The next question is, what does the patient want? You know, she's been on a lot of biologics, a lot of injectables, she's been on some pills. Does she want a pill or does she want an injectable? Does that seem to, either one seem to fit into her work, lifestyle, etc.? This patient was a little, was okay with whatever we suggested, but really wanted to lean more towards a pill. And then lastly, you do some defensive prescribing in many of these people getting around to the ninth or 10th or seventh or fourth different DMARD that you're going to use, uh, hopefully in combination. So, and by defensive prescribing, I mean, you wouldn't use a TNF inhibitor in someone who had a history of TB, latent TB, um, uh, fungal infection, or recurrent severe infections. It's just too problematic, and you're ans asking the, answering the question about the drug and infection too many times. It's easier to move on to other therapies. Similarly, if someone had a history of hepatitis B, treated or untreated, you wouldn't use a TNF inhibitor, or tuximab, or even abatacept. They had a history of, of severe coronary artery disease, heart failure, and MI, you wouldn't use an non-steroidal and steroids. And lastly, if they had a history of diverticulosis, GI perforations, lower GI perforations, you wouldn't use tocilizumab or an IL-6 inhibitor or one of the JAK inhibitors, which can also cause lower intestinal GI perforations. In this particular patient, she chose to go with a JAK inhibitor. Uh, we kept her on her sulfazalazine. 
her low dose prednisone. We told her on a JAK inhibitor, she should have an early response, could be two to four, maybe even six weeks, but we're gonna know in six weeks. And so we brought her back for a return visit at that time point. And if she's not hitting a home run, we're moving on to our next best therapy. This is how my nurse practitioner and I resolved this issue. So again, why is Room Now Live the best meeting for nurse practitioners? So far our registration, which is really doing quite well, it's getting quite busy. Um, we have 10 to 15% of the registrants are uh, nurse practitioners and physician assistants. We have pre-learning assignments that you're gonna see before you come. We have um, handouts that you can download both during the meeting and before the meeting. Uh, there's a lot of Q&A at this meeting. Uh, again, over 25% of the time, or four hours of the 16 hours of CME is gonna be devoted to Q&A. And there's a lot more that's gonna happen uh, just spontaneously. Uh, it's a great chance for networking given the large number of NPs and PAs who are gonna to come to the meeting. Uh, check it out at roomnow.live. We'll talk to you more this week about these Q 